The Dutch GP in 1978 marked the last time an American won a Formula One Grand Prix. The track is quite a bit different, but the car we'll see compete today is the same. We may not get to see another American win today, but we'll no doubt see some excitement as we get ready to watch round four of the Lotus 79 Sunday Grand Prix series. And you'll see it all live here on the Global Sim Racing Channel. I am Joe Peek and joining me in the booth is Roush Racing driver Joey Atterbury. Behind the scenes is our director, Daniel Costello, and he's using cameras provided by Doug Beard. Zandvoort is perhaps one of the most unique road courses you'll see host a major series. Let's get a closer look at the variety of banked corners here at our track guide. Welcome to Circuit Park Zandvoort. This legendary track directly to the west of Amsterdam and a stone's throw away from the shore of the North Sea has seen more than half a century of racing history. After a brief period of being closed, it was rebuilt in the 90s and then given a huge facelift in 2019 to see the return of Formula One. It retained its four and a quarter kilometer length and 14 turns for the Grand Prix course, while the other three versions also stayed mostly unchanged. But the biggest adaptations were the additions of steep banking at Hugenholtz and Leyendijk. The unusual progressive banking in Hugenholtz in particular stands out as it brings the oval racing staple to the twisty side of motorsports and has produced action-packed results. Meanwhile, Lion Dyke's new camber means that this corner is now easily flat out in pretty much every car and gives even better chances to try and overtake into the famous Tarzan. That said, passing is notoriously difficult at this highly technical track. And while it's much slower than its original guys, it still has some frighteningly fast corners, including Shivlock. 
If you're brave, the Hans Ernst chicane can sometimes offer chances to sneak by someone, but it can often become a clumsy wreck if you're not careful. The amount of cash poured into the upgrades certainly produced more than just a fresh coat of paint. The spectacular racing put on by everything from open wheelers to touring cars and sports cars is almost never dull. It's no wonder the Dutch fans come out in droves when the green flag waves here. Well, Joey, the locals call it Zandvoort, but I call it a really cool track. It is a really neat beachside track up here in the Netherlands. 13 turns, 2.67 miles, or just a tick under 4.3 kilometers, depending on how you want to look at it. And turn one, Tarzan, probably the best passing opportunity as it is from the start finish straight away, has a decent break zone, but some really cool areas here on this racetrack. Turn number three, that is that really steep banked turn that we're gonna see probably a few different lines on the opening lap, but then after turn number three, turns four through seven, I really describe it as a roller coaster. It is a single lane racetrack through these winding S's up and over some elevation turns nine and 10 just after the masters down there it slows everything down you got to be careful in the 79 cars especially in those lower gears with that right foot don't spin up those rear tires and then turns 11 and 12 down there hans ernst also kind of the stadium section is what i call it a sneaky little passing opportunity but there is gravel down there so you got to be careful not to overshoot the brake zone Turn 13, Kumo, that's really the final turn on this racetrack. The final turn, Ari, Larned, Ari Leyendijk corner. That is just a steep, banked, flat-out turn onto the front straightaway. The only reason I, I, I know how to say Leyendijk is because I grew up watching IndyCar, to be honest. But uh, I, sh I should have known it, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what's interesting to the championship, though, is that we've got Lapisto leading in the points right now. Now, he won the last two races, but Costa wasn't there last time out at Barcelona. He was beat at Mugello, though. So Lapisto... Uh, it might be up at the top of the points, but he's got Juan Mi back here today. We have to see if he's going to be able to outpace him here at this track, especially where track position is so key. Jack David Spickett doing an excellent job up in the third with Frisha uh, sitting in fourth place. We lacked a lot of these F1 drivers last time out, so it's a bit jumbled up. We might see it return kind of uh, to how it uh, typically is after this round, since we have a lot more of those F1 drivers. It was the F2 drivers that feasted well last time, Joey. You're right. There is a lot of points handed out in this group right here. Daniel Gallus currently leading the way a dozen points over Andy Hugel, who had a good finish there last week. Sebastian Zahul there in third place, just a single point out of second. And we got Keith Herner, AJ Roper all inside the top five, but include Cam Porter in that because he is tied right there with AJ Roper. And AJ had a fantastic finish and look at how close everything is. Only a single point, if that, separating Cam, George Baitev, Patrick Samaran, Cruikshank back here, and Kurt Clapper only a couple points out of it. So Joe, like you were saying, lots of points handed out last week in that F2 championship wonder if that's going to wind up being decisive later on in the season. As for today's race, it's 28 laps around for round four. Uh, open setup in this series, but they're probably going to be cranking up the wing at this track to find lap time. No spare car. And the barriers are actually very close in a lot of places. This is still uh, an old school track in that sense. Drive through penalty at 17 incidents and a DQ at 25 means that what places they've added some paved runoff, you don't want to abuse too much around here. Now, Costa has just taken the pole away from the Pisto. Ante was on the top spot on the first lap, but Costa jumping it up to a 22-9 has about a two-tenths advantage now. This is a high-strung racetrack. They have fast lap times around this place. This is the new Zanford, right? So we got to make sure that the speeds are way up there as we watch these qualifying laps come in. This is the number three car. This is Gernot Frisia. Now he still has another lap to put down and he's all the way back there in eighth place. I'd expect Gernot to kind of jump up and 
what we see out of these cars typically that second lap a lot faster than the first one well we've got a bit of an overcast day so it, it's rather cool out here one thing that it is unusual for this track there is very little wind with this is literally right on the sea you said it was beachside I mean, you go over the hill on the front stretch and there is the sea. So typically you see tons and tons of wind blowing across here and often getting some of that sand onto the track. But today it is nice and still. So that will help the drivers somewhat, but they'll need to get those tires up to 10th because Gernot comes out of the infield section now down into Hans Ernst. You talk about it being the stadium section during races now. They add in all these stands that you can see around and it is absolute just uh, just completely covered in orange, whatever uh, uh, Max is racing here. And this is 13, that's really what I call the final turn because this turn right here, this turn 14, or I should say 13, is just that sweeping long right-hander which feeds you out. Let's see what Gurnaw puts down this time. 23.5, so that will jump him up definitely inside of the top five, in fact, into third much needed improvement almost two seconds quicker that time makes me wonder how much faster the tires are on this second lap uh, just because of those heating issues as uh, daniel gallus is our last driver able to set a time no i take that back ralph freckleton looks like he's on his second lap so he's the only other one that we're going to see complete our qualifying as we watch daniel up and around sheave lock and then down into masters and uh, Daniel Gallus should be able to make it around in time. About 40 seconds left. I think he'll have enough to be able to complete this. Not unless he spins it. That is going to do it for Daniel Gallus out there. And I can report that Dylan Freckleton's time did not count. So even though he crossed the start finish line in time, he must have had an off track or an incident somewhere. So he's going to have to be starting from seven. You can see how tight it would have been because even with that little moment, Daniel Gallus at 10 seconds left is not going to reach the time, the line in at time. So he spins it off the course and gets himself an extra incident point, which do count, by the way, during qualifying. Uh, looks like that means that our, our pole sitter is going to be Juan Mi Costa and Anti Lapisto going to be flanking him to the outside for the start of this race. Gernot Frisia starting in third. What can he do off the line to try and maybe take those positions off them as Oliver Haas will be starting to his outside. Florian Hoon is gonna be in the fifth spot. Jean-Francois Boscus will be P6 and Dylan Freckleton at seventh. Then it's Tobias Rohner starting from eighth as row five has Timothy Reed to the inside and Barry West rounding out your top 10. And row number six is Stefan Walder in the number six car lining up in 11th and Christian Kremer in 12th. Cam Porter is going to be starting in 13th with Alan Berteau next to him in 14th. Sven Lunig in 15th. Seamus Power 16th. And then on the final row is Patrick Samarang starting 17th and Daniel Gallus the final and 18th car on the grid. All righty, so as the cars now get ready for the start as we said going to be important to get a good jump off the line because we then will have drivers mostly line astern for much of the race we're expecting it is possible to pass but difficult as uh, there is one more look at the conditions which haven't changed much as we switch over to the race session itself round four of the season for these drivers is Looks like Brito is going to be our last driver to line up. And there we go. Cars are ready as the engines now start to rev and the lights come up. Who will we see take victory? Green flag is out. Oh, it's a horrible start for Lapisto. He bogs down big time. Cars having to avoid around the side as he drops down to fifth, almost sixth position. And Frisha is now into second behind Costa. He is going to have a long ways to go in this race, but it is Costa leading Frisha out front. And then Haas and Hoon there in third and fourth as we go into this steep bank section. Look at all the differing lines. We see three different lines through there on the first lap. Hugenholtz is one of those corners that has been changed since they updated this circuit around 2020. Dylan Freckleton trying to get in underneath there, but no dice is they're still trying to dice for position down in the sheave lock now, now heading towards Masters. This is definitely a single file corner. And 
Freckleton, after not getting in that second lap, had a poor start. He's already down five positions as he slides it down to the inside of Walder right there, trying to get to the inside, but it puts him on the outside of the track now for this left-hander. Looks like he is going to have enough grip and tire temperature to make that work. And I believe Barry West, the big cat, was a little loose off the corner. Freckleton's going to take advantage. Two positions at about two corners. Yes, indeed. Freckleton on a charge now. Barry still struggling as he dips his tires into the gravel a little bit down through Hans Ernst. Checking in on Lapisto. He's trying to make up for his poor start already as he is all over the back of Hoon. Yeah, you got to get the drive out of this final turn, which he does already in the slipstream, already driver's right. So this should be straightforward. Now the front straightaway is not very long. And look at this, Hoon defends. You can do that on the racing line here in turn number one. You got to really be up alongside him. Just goes to show how hard it is to try and overtake as uh, we watch Freckleton and behind Tim, I believe West is under attack from Stefan Walder and more cars trying to go around the outside. Once again, the banking offers up all kinds of lines. Great run by Power. Yeah, Seamus Power used that high line, that Darlington line around turn number three to launch himself. And now the Big Cat is trying to look to the inside of Walder, but this is an area of the racetrack that it's just a roller coaster. You can't go too wide through a lot of these sections, or I should say you can't go too wide without cooperation. Yeah, you're going to be massively slow through here. Just a bit of a look underneath from Breteau, seeing if he can overtake Seamus. Not going to work that time. Ducking it down to the inside. Barry West trying to play defense here through almost every corner. He does not like this car early on. Lapisto finally gets it done past Florian into fourth. That was into that Hans Erst section. So made the crowd happy right there, getting that pass done. So anti Lapisto up into fourth. And he doesn't have too far up the road to go to Haas. That's right there in front of him in third place. So I have a feeling the guy that started on the front row, he's looking to get back up there. I'm not sure if he made the crowd happy because I think Florian hails from the Diach Club, <laughs> which means he might be a Dutch driver. So uh, Timothy Reed in the meantime, getting very close to Jean-Francois, not able to make that pass stick. So he'll have to try again. Now he's got to watch out behind because Freckleton is getting very close. You know, for how small this racetrack is, Joe, I think that it provides some fantastic racing. You know, they do have higher downforce levels, but look at the driving that you get to do through this section. I describe it as a roller coaster. You really better hang on in these downforce cars. Got to call a real race uh, out in Nevada recently at a very tight and twisty track. We all predicted it was going to be very processional, but we saw passes like this where drivers had to get creative and certainly were aggressive. Freckleton now going to try and finish it up the long way around on Timothy Reed. We saw him do that before. Oh, but he got a little slip up on wheel spin. Yeah, but he does have the driver's track position. And in fact, Timothy Reed says, you know what, you can have that spot. I think that Freckleton does have top five speed. Remember, he was seventh, but didn't get to put in that second qualifying lap, then fell way down the order. I'd keep an eye on that number four car to keep the charge on. If you notice Samaran moved down to the back of the tower on the left-hand side, that's because Sven Lunig unfortunately made some contact with him. Costa setting the fastest lap of the race, and Timothy Reed. Once again, getting awful close, but this time not to Boscus, but to Freckleton. I can say, let's check out this GSRC replay first here. So this is going to be Patrick Samaran here in this slower section of the racetrack. This is turn nine and then coming up to turn number 10 here. No, oh, just right into the back there, get spun around. So the number 17, Sven Lunig, also involved in that one. Yeah, sad to see that they'll kind of trundle down to the back, but they both are able to continue. Just uh, we don't know how much damage they might have. You might notice that Lapisto's now up into third. I think you caught this, Joey. It looks like he overtook Haas. Yeah, it was just down the front straightaway, similar to how he got by Hoon the, the couple laps before. So I feel like anti Lapisto now has a little bit of clean air, but that clean air that's four and a half seconds that he's got to go hunt down Gernot Frisia as we check out Freckleton. Once again, just trying to make these moves work his way forward. And Dylan's still down one spot from where he started this race. He must have had a, a poor run off the line that we missed because, man, he's been making passes left and right here. 
And I think it also just shows that the downforce levels, the, the drivers have confidence in the car here, right? They can kind of put the car wherever they need to, and that entices the driver to try some creative lines like you were talking about, maybe do something a little bit out of the ordinary to surprise the driver. Well, Amikos is still your leader, about a second and a half over Gernot Frisia. Gernot is kind of known for having a car that tends to come on strong late in the race, so I don't think we have any reason to fret at this stage. It's not a huge gap, and he could pick it up and try and challenge on that number one machine uh, a little bit farther down the line. Uh, but really, most of the fights have been in the midfield up to this stage, including that one we were watching before that Freckleton is still getting dangerously close to the number seven. So to your point here, Joe, I, I would be a little bit worried if I was Juan Mikosta out front because, like you said, Gernot Frisia tends to get faster and faster. And Gernot, that last time around, was the fastest lap of anybody out there by two tenths, in fact, faster than Juan Mi. So if he continues this pace and we're only a quarter of the way into this thing or a fifth of the way into this thing, I'd watch out if I was Costa. Absolutely. And here is Oliver. As we jump back to the man that lost the podium spot, he's still got Florian behind him. I'm trying to see, I don't, yeah, we don't have any DH drivers in on the podium now that Oliver has been demoted, but still, he's got the number 12 on his car and he's running in fourth. So this is looking like a pretty good day for him. And he did capitalize on that start. He was one of the cars that got by Lapisto on the beginning. So he's evidently got the fundamentals down. He knows this racetrack very well, apparently. And he has good pace. Yes, he does have Florian right behind him, but that's part of racing. You got to deal with the anxiety. You got to deal with pressure behind you. And most of the time, your mirrors are going to be full around here at Zanfort. Looks like Florian's getting a little bit close to Ollie there. So he's got to play it safe he has to make sure not to make any mistakes or else any slip up is probably going to be jumped upon by that uh, black machine and then also in behind them Tobias Rohner that uh, seems to be uh, kind of getting close as well in that old Craco livery might as well throw the rest of the names in there too Joe because Dylan Freckleton is faster than this group of three and he's also bringing along Jean-Francois Boscus, Timothy Reed so I have a feeling that if Haas and Florian start to battle, it is just going to compress up that whole train. Yeah, I think you're right on that one. Checking in on Timothy and Jean-Francois coming around the banking. You can see this is easily flat out. They all hang around the bottom of the corner to try and shorten that line, extend the run as fast as they can down towards Tarzan, but nothing doing as uh, Tobias Rohner is again starting to become a threat to Florian, but it's tough to pass coming into Hugenholtz here. Let's see who runs high, who runs low. All of them trying to use the banking up on the high line and they stay as they were. Now, Joe, something I noticed out of this yellow car of Tobias Rohner on the front straightaway this lap, he was close enough and he thought about a little bit of a move into turn number one. He was really far back, but Let's see what he's going to try to do. He's already up a couple positions, so I have a feeling that Tobias Rohner is more on the attack than these two cars in front of him. Yeah, I think you might be right. Let's see if he can try and do something here as he's very strong on the win, but it's the exit he needs coming down into Hans Ernst. He stays pretty close to him. He's getting a toe. Florian doesn't defend the inside, but he doesn't need to as there's no attack from Tobias that time out of that stadium section here. Just put the power down. It is so crucial here. Turn number 12, get through it efficiently because it leads out onto the straightaway. And here we go, Joe. Rohner's got a fantastic run. He's so much closer this time. Look at that right up on the gearbox, pops out to the inside. Can he finish it? We've seen drivers defend the long way around into Tarzan before. Whoa, they're gonna make contact. Sort of elbows his rival out of the way. They're gonna stay both on the track, but a rude but effective method. And look who is right there to capitalize again is, oh my goodness, that was a close one right there. Rohner and Florian still in that battle. And Whoa. now Dylan Freckleton is going to try to capitalize. Didn't see it on screen, but he ran him nearly off the road. Went down to the inside of the track. Dylan, four wheels 
into the grass. I hope we can get a look at that one after maybe we get some action finished. He's going to get to the inside. I wonder if maybe he kind of let him through on that one after he felt bad about that. Yeah, and I have also, I've also been noticing that Freckleton is so fast going there into that 7, 8, 9 section. So here's the GSRC replay. So watch the silver and purple car. It's got a fantastic run and pretty much is just run off the road. I mean, to be fair, the, he didn't have the overlap, but it was a late, late move there that you and, don't and, usually expect. Correct. And I mean, how many times have I already said it? That's just an area of the racetrack that you don't go too wide without cooperation. Well, the, the cooperation wasn't there that time. And eventually uh, he lets him go when he gets a good run down into Masters. So the changes have changed, or the spots have changed. And now he is through. Did we just have a car into pit lane? Yes, I Where see. Who? Yeah, and I, I almost wonder if there's damage on the front end of this car or maybe he didn't get enough gas in it. I see him all the way he's, up on the stand, so. He's got a, a meatball flag, so that's the reason why he's in, unfortunately. I wonder where this came from because we didn't see any sort of contact from, we, from anything I saw. We did. He was the one that got kind of barged out uh, of the way through Tarzan. That's really unfortunate. It wasn't that heavy, it looked like, but it was just enough to damage the suspension. You know what? I'm going to kind of put the pieces together and surmise that he wasn't trying to block. He was trying to get out of the way of Freckleton when he eventually went off to the side. And that's why he made that that strange dive off to the side out of a, a, a Fugenholz. You know, Joe, you pretty much are Sherlock Holmes over here. You have put the clues together and I agree with you. I think you're right as we're watching now Seamus Power attack on Barry West. So this is the battle for what is 11th place on the racetrack. Now, Seamus has gone up four positions from where he started. Barry West is pretty much hung out right there, 10th, 11th, where he started. So I have a feeling that Seamus is the one that's trying to get around, but not too far out in front of Barry is that number six car as well. Seamus up four spots from where he started this race, doing a great run on this one. And uh, in fact, gained a, a spot last time out because of that uh, pit stop that we saw from Florian. So now up into 12th as he chases on the big cat down into Hugen Holtz. They're also kind of seeing Stefan Walder up the road. He's not too far away from the pair of them. If he's got the pace, he could be sizing up maybe two spots before this race is over. Through this incredibly fast section, it is so difficult to do anything here, but coming up into turn eight and nine and 10, you can slice down the inside if you're close enough. Seamus Power not quite there. You see the little bit of a lunge there into turn number nine. That is just purely a judgment on how far you can keep that front end tucked to the inside of the racetrack. And then once again, turn number 10 is all about that corner exit leading up into Hans Ernst. Seamus, one of those that missed one of his qualifying laps. So maybe he put just a banker in on the second. It wasn't as quick as he could have gone. And that's why he started so far down. Barry West, uh, who started himself up in 10th, has been kind of losing positions here after the start of this race. As he watches behind, we can see through the slot below the rear wing that Seamus is close, but not close enough. And we've seen just how short this front straightaway is, so you, you got to be really close. And the other thing is that Barry West has now caught Walder right in front of him, so down that front straightaway, not only is Seamus going to have to be very close, but Barry West is also getting pulled along from the slipstream. So it's going to be a battle that's going to go on for a little bit as we check in on Dylan Freckleton. He's going to try his hand at getting by Tobias Rohner right in front of him. Coming down now into the back-to-back -back hairpins here. This is where we've seen some sneaky moves out of Freckleton, but no repeat of that here today is ahead of them. Look at how wide Oliver just went coming up around that corner. So he's got to watch out more mistakes like that. And Tobias and Dylan will have opportunities to try and pounce on as deep into the corner. Look at how strong Dylan is down into that chicane. I think that Freckleton really has the downforce level cranked into it and couple that probably just with a nicely tuned setup. That driver is very confident 
in the car that he's got underneath him. So that means he can kind of put it wherever he wants to. And you're right, Joe, that number 12 car of Haas, that was a very poor lap from him. 124.6, compare that to Rohner, 23.7 right behind him. And, and wow. here we go, Seamus Power is much closer to Barry West. Does he try anything? Barry West actually wants to try and make a move, or maybe that's just a defense on Seamus. Not able to overtake, but also prevents anything from behind as they are now line astern. Stefan Walder very much under threat from those two cars in his mirrors. That was a bad run from Barry West. Spun up the tires a little bit. Seamus Power looking off to the side. It's tricky to try and pass down into Sheev Lock, and he doesn't have the overlap for it. Well, they're just going to stay as they are through this section, but... Keep an eye on that third car line, Seamus. Does he slide up the inside here? We've seen Freckleton do it, but actually a little bit wide there. I made the comment, that's a judgment break zone. You really just have to kind of feel it out every time. And sometimes you do go in a little bit deep, but honestly, Seamus has put the back half of it together. He puts the power down quite nicely out of 10 and Barry West actually kind of has to posture in the break zone a little bit going into the stadium. Glad you mentioned that about that corner. I hate breaking for that turn. I feel like I never get it the same time twice whenever I try and get on the binders. And uh, Seamus Power, maybe a little deep on that one, is still close. He, this is where he needs that run. As we check back in with Runer and Freckleton has gotten by him. So pass has been made. Dylan up into the top five now. Yeah, so Freckleton actually got the job done last lap through this section right here. So Rohner might have taken some notes from how Freckleton got by him. And now Dylan is on the charge to go catch P4. And I think that that's the best thing possible for that yellow number 10 car. Let Freckleton pull you along in that battle. And all of a sudden, it's going to be three cars for what is arguing over fourth place. This has really been a fantastic drive from Freckleton. We've seen some good ones in the past, but he's doing his darndest to see if he can at least get up to fourth to give himself a shot at trying to take a podium. Meanwhile, Power versus West once again. Stefan Walder actually running away a little bit now that these two have been squabbling. We're going to check out the onboard, looking over the shoulder of Sheamus, and he's tantalizingly close in some of these corners. So I've noticed that Barry West doesn't always get the car tucked down to the apex in some of those really slow corners. However, he does manage the back half of the corner very nicely. So he puts the power down and is able to run away from Seamus Power where he needs to. And once again, you see him about a half a car length off of the apex there, but he capitalizes on the back half of the corner and then he's got the benefit of the slipstream down the front straightaway. This is frustrating for Seamus Power for sure. Well, Barry is a smart driver. I think he knows it's these corner exits that he needs to worry about. Uh, as long as he can keep him from getting up the inside into some of those apexes, he is good to try and launch off of the corners. Wasn't good last time. Let's see what it looks like here as he takes a bit of a midline through there. And then once again, he is just not as good coming off the turn. Oh, and, and I tell you what, Power's got that Darlington line, that top line in turn three really figured out. He launches off of that corner, but just doesn't really have anywhere to put it through that four, five, six, seven section and just kind of has to follow along with Barry West through the slow bits as we check back in on Dylan Freckleton. It's kind of equal distance between these three here, but he is slowly and surely closing it in on Oliver Haas up here. And the one thing that we've seen out of that red 12 car, Joe, Sometimes the laps are great, but he has had a lap or two that have just not been up to par every now and then. Yeah, consistency will be so important, but I think track position we've seen is, is if equally, if not more important here today because some drivers have been able to make the passes some have not dylan's one that has made the passes and he is looking maybe ambitious there coming down into tarzan he's got the downforce levels but you still have to be up alongside as this is kremer versus gallus so these are two names that we haven't mentioned at all but this is the battle for 14th place back here Daniel Gallus actually having a pretty decent run. He's up four positions, so Kremer is trying to fight back. Wow, Freckleton regains that time very fast, and Ali now has a mirror full of that gray and purple machine. Here we go, power. Oh, I thought maybe 
he finally had the opportunity but still just can't seem to get the overlap he needs. He's going to try and cut back underneath, down through Sheevlock. A brief little fade to the inside from Barry West to try and dissuade that Valvoline car from getting through as now they head into 9 and 10. I think that Seamus Power is starting to feel it out a little bit more. Let's see if he can over under this. So this is a sneaky passing opportunity up into turn 11. Barry West covers it off really nicely, so Sheamus is going to have to wait all the way around, probably until turn one, until the next opportunity arises, but he's closer than he ever has been. I know this is frustrating with the, uh, the dirty air following so closely, but you just got to stay there a few more corners. As they kick up Sparks being pushed into the ground through the banking. I think he's just too far back once again. Uh, I wonder if maybe he also has a little bit more wing than Barry West has and is struggling to try and get those big runs that he needs. Tobias has not given up on Dylan, so Dylan actually backed off of Ollie a little bit now. He's got to be careful. If Dylan makes a bad move, then uh, Tobias could try and uh, get that spot right back. They are just all so close between these three and it's just pretty much been a repeat through that three, four, five section of that power versus West combo. And since we are just past halfway, Joe, check this out. Juan Costa has stretched it out. He is about three seconds over Gurnot Frisia right now. So even though we said Gurnot's car gets faster and faster as the race goes on, looks like Costa is definitely the car to beat today. Yeah, I was going to say, this This looks a lot more comfortable. There you can see how big that gap is. Three and a half doesn't sound like a lot. But that's going to be massive to try and pull in if you're Gernot Frisia. We'll see whether or not he'll start to pick it up later on. Anti Lapisto, though, still down in third, just set the fastest lap of the race. And for Lapisto, this is also important because now Costa not just going to beat him, but beat him by two positions as it sits. I think it's an interesting chess match because Lapisto hasn't crawled in any time to Gernot Frisia or Juan Mi Costa. So those front three are pretty much set barring any sort of mistake or, or lap traffic mishap. So I have a feeling, Joe, it is going to be that chess game of who snags the fastest lap as whoa, Freckleton whoa. slides down the inside of Haas. And that was some cooperation between the two because we've seen it before. It's just not an area that you go too wide, but Freckleton has some speed today. That was gutsy, and he, I mean, he barely had the wing up to the rear tire, uh, tire, so Oliver was very heads up in that situation, saw it coming, decided not to wreck them both out and chop down to the apex and let him through. Will he unfortunately lose two positions in one lap? No, doesn't look like it, as Tobias could not get through down into Hans Ernst. He's still close to him, though, so he's not out of the woods. So what I'm curious about these two cars right here is I've really noticed that Roner in turn number three capitalizes on that very top line. He might not even have to wait till turn three. Look at this. He's already pulled up alongside of Haas here in the number 12 car. Can he outbreak him? We've seen the racing line be able to take it so deep into turn number one, but Roner completes the pass. Curious if Oliver has some damage on the underside that we don't see because he just seemed extremely slow off that corner, unusually so. So I'm a bit curious if he facilitated that or what, because I did not expect him to catch him that quickly. Yes, uh, the other thing that I'm going to point out is, you know, Oliver, we haven't seen that name too much. Same thing with Tobias Rohner, and we are in the back half of the race. So if you used up the tire a little bit early on, you might be suffering with it now or it just might be the racecraft of these two moving their way forward past a car. Exactly. A good catch on that one. Back to Barry West in the meantime. Uh, still sandwiched between Power and Walder. And they'll come down into the infield section themselves. Now down to 11 laps to go for these guys. So a fair bit of the race still left to complete. Although Barry goes a little wide. He's got to watch out now because Power gets a pretty good run. I want to make the comment that three or four laps ago that Seamus power into this section right here, he had a huge wiggle, a huge moment that he didn't drive it off the racetrack, but lost a ton of time. So 
he has actually crawled it back up to this battle. So I really do feel like Sheamus is probably the fastest car of these three that we see on the screen, but it is all down to the race craft, down to the setup, and you still got to get past them. Just because you're faster doesn't mean you automatically get the spot. Now that was interesting. Dylan Freckleton took the fastest lap of the race. Not often that you see Dylan do that. We'll see Juan Mee, Gernot, Antti all kind of swap it throughout the race. But Dylan, I mean, he's been freed up. Clearly, there is pace in that number four. And, and that was no draft, right? That was no draft on the front straightaway from any car. And oh, Ooh. here we go, Sheamus around the left side of Barry West here. But Barry West can keep his foot in it. They're going to stay too wide and West fights back. Oh, love that from Barry West. He, he didn't have the momentum, but he knew he was going to have the inside and he stuck with it. He is going to hold on to that spot, but just barely hanging on by his fingernails now at this stage. You could say hanging on by his claws out there, <laughs> Joe. But you're, you're right. You know, Seamus Power has thrown everything and the kitchen sink at Barry West, but Barry's doing a tremendous job not driving the car off the racetrack, not going too deep in any brake zones. He just kind of puts it right where he needs to, oftentimes right in the middle of the racetrack, and he's doing a fantastic job hanging on to 11th. So can he hold him off down into Tarzan now is the question because power is still right up on top of him. If he can stick with it, oh, he washes up just a little bit coming through Ari Leyendijk, and that cost him just the couple feet that he needed to try and make an attack here. So Barry West still keeping him at arm's length for the time being as we come back to uh, Oliver versus Tobias. This is down into turn uh, uh, into Shivlock here for the fifth position. And as they head through Masters once again, drivers looking a little bit stuck now at this stage, not seeing as many passes. Oh, and as soon as I say that, Barry West was in the exact same position as last lap going side by side with power. Wonder if he's gonna slice down to the inside here. I feel like Seamus does have the speed and oh, there's another big lunge, but just can't get the car to the inside of Barry West here. Now we've seen West run really wide through the apex, has it tucked nice and tidy. And actually, Joe, check this out. Seamus Power is all over the gearbox, but Barry just puts the car right in the middle of the track. Oh my goodness, too wide. He's gonna get shoved out, not into the gravel, but the long way around into turn number 11 oftentimes doesn't work. Oh, this gives him the switch back though, still defending. Barry West gonna take a shallower line. Will we finally see Sheamus close enough now? Coming out of the final corner, he's closer than he was last time. At the very least, the big cat, will he defend? No, doesn't have to. Once again, he's quicker in a straight line in comparison to Sheamus. Yeah, he is, but I think this was step number one for Sheamus is, is get Barry West out of the draft of Walder right in front of him. So. I know it might not be a win, but look at the capitalization off of turn number three, and he actually has to check up right there before he runs straight into the gearbox of Barry West. So I really feel like if you can handle that top lane through turn number three, Joe, it can provide you some tremendous exit speed. Well, and this is why I'm kind of confused because Barry seems so committed to that middle line. Surely he's figured out by now that it's slowing him down in comparison, and I would think he'd maybe shift up a lane. I think when we analyze that one specific corner, the track out on exit of turn number three, if you overstep that, it is a very dangerous area. Not only the alligator curves, but you're coming up over the crest as well. I think that's probably just a safety margin. That could be, yeah, good call on that one. And Cam Porter is caught up with Jean-Francois Boscus. Uh, Cam, up four. We haven't really been paying attention to him. He's been having a good run. I thought for a second maybe uh, the Frenchman was going to dive into pit lane, but no, he's just trying to break the slipstream. Do whatever you can here. However, uh, you know, I don't feel like the straightaway is quite long enough at Zanfort, but anything you can do to play the mind games against your competitor, sometimes that is exactly what the drivers are doing out there. Same deal between Gallus and Kremer and... Uh, Looks like Kremer's not going to be close enough either. Christian not having the best start to this race, having gridded up in 12th and now is down to 15th. But 
He's seeing if he can maybe get by Daniel Gallus, who's one of our drivers who failed to set a qualifying time. This battle is just deja vu after deja vu. Like, it is just lap after lap, the exact same thing through turn three, and then Sheamus is all over the back of him through the back half section of this racetrack, and then they simply rinse and repeat through turn number 11 and 12 here. I wonder when Sheamus is going to be able to do, or, or maybe even try something a little bit different. Well, and that's my question to you as he looks good on the brakes down into Hans Ernst, is put yourself in the shoes of Sheamus. You know where Barry is going to be strong, where he's going to be weak. Where would you try to be attacked? You have to capitalize out of the exit of turn three. You have to put your car even on the outside lane when you don't want to, per se. Whatever lane Barry is going to take out of turn three, you need to take the other lane because you've got such a tremendous acceleration advantage. You just need to do something different because if you do the same thing, you're going to have the same result every time. Same result here for Gallus, who stays in head of Christian. And uh, that's going to keep him into 14th for this lap around. Back to Cam Porter once again, within two tenths now of the number seven machine, becoming more and more of a problem for that bright yellow car as they come out of Shivlock down into Masters. Six laps to go. Cam, sometimes he can, he's, he's a very polite driver. And sometimes though, he can be more aggressive. I'm curious which Cam we're gonna see today on trying to take this spot away. Just watching the last, you know, half a lap here between these two, it feels like Cam Porter in this white and red car is a little bit more neat and tidy than Boskus right in front of him. So I have a feeling as long as he keeps that up, he should be able to continue to close it as we check back in on Haas versus Rohner. Remember that Rohner got around that red number 12 car maybe 10, 12 laps ago, but ever since then, Oliver Haas has not given up. And I love that never say die attitude. You get overtaken, you, you try and hang with them, see if you can get that spot back. And they do seem to be very closely matched between these two as both of them definitely take the alligator curbs coming off of Hugenholtz, trying to open up that corner exit as it accelerates all the way here where it's maybe a little bit of a lift, maybe a brush of the brakes down into Shevlock, incredibly fast corner before it finally slows up into the newer section of the track. You mentioned that they're pretty evenly matched. Even on I rating, these guys are only a couple hundred I rating apart from each other. So these are two drivers in two cars that are very, very similar to each other. And coming down to the last handful of laps here, who's got that grit to reach down deep and grab that position? All of them in the mid 3000s in terms of I rating, which is also kind of impressive if you look farther up the order. Uh, Costa, Frisia, Lapisto, all 6,000 I rating drivers. In fact, Costa's nearly up to 7,000 up there at the lead of the pack today. As Frisha then meanwhile takes the fastest lap of the race. You'll continue to see that plunge as the cars get lighter and lighter. And Dylan Freckleton takes another one out of that top group with a 22.8 for him. He's got it down to under seven seconds behind Lapisto. Unfortunately for Dylan, I feel like if he had a better qualifying, he probably could have challenged for the podium, but he's lost too much time. Agree. 100% agree with you. And Anti Lapisto has done a great job ever since he got in clean air. And I've been watching this gap. He is closing it in on Gernot Frisha down to about 1.3 seconds. So actually, Frisha just had a mistake there in the last couple of turns, has allowed Anti to kind of close it in. And this is all Lapisto needs is just maybe a little bit of a carrot out in front of him. Certainly going to be pushing hard to try and make that up. He knows the championship fight with Costa is going to be tough because yes, Juan Mi is about 80 points behind him right now, but that's without taking into account drop weeks still since we're so early on as they start to count those later on in the season, he'll become, uh, he'll get closer and closer to him. And we watch Cam Porter now starting to hunt on Jean-Francois Boscus, and they'll break into Hans Ernst. Yeah, this is definitely not close enough this time, but I'm pretty sure Cam is starting to set him up. Yeah, he just looks a lot cleaner through all of these corners, and I think that Boscus is actually struggling with the rear tires a little bit. Was loose going into Hans Ernst? Was loose coming out of there? So. 
Camp Order is close enough that he's got a down force level. He can close it in on the front straightaway. You see Boscus all the way to the inside, so they're dead even on the top end. Cam is going to have to get up there and force a pass, either that or force Boscus into a mistake. We've had an off for Gallus. He was playing defense for so long, he unfortunately blinked first, and he has now fallen down to 15th. Ooh, another little lockup coming through the banking, and that is the time for Cam Porter to pounce on this one. Going side by side, he's going to be on the wrong side, coming into Sheev Lock, and I don't think that's going to work out for him. He'll allow Boskus to hold on for now. Yeah, but keep an eye. Oh, and here's Barry West also. He's going to try to sneak by as Freckleton. Oh, no, did we have a problem with Freckleton? He's fallen all the way back to sixth. He had an off somewhere this lap. Oh, he spun the tires coming out of the infields, and that was just enough. They were close enough that both overtook him. All that hard work has been undone. I can report. So we're going to get a GSRC replay of exactly what happened to Freckleton as I see Cam Porter getting spun around right now. So Freckleton spins up those rear tires all by himself, just a little bit too happy with that right foot. You don't have any downforce there in turn number 10, and around it went. I can tell you, I've gone back and looked at Cam Porter. He had contact actually with the Jean-Francois. I think that may have slowed him down because Barry West is now right on top of him. As we check out Costa here in the lead, I think Barry West has gone from defense now suddenly to attack. Costa continues to lap around, and you're right, Barry West is all over the back here. So what was kind of separated out now has turned into an intense battle. And here's Seamus Whoa. Power forcing his way through. Holy smokes, got the run out of turn three, and he's going to try to keep on moving forward on Boscus. He's finally got around West. He's still right on the tail here. He smells blood in the water. Shame is showing that patience is indeed a virtue. All he needed was Jean-Francois Boscus to slow up his rival, and that's when he could make the move. His white flag is out all oh, around the outside, and Boscus is in no mood to give up another position. I really feel like Boscus is struggling with his car, and Seamus has had enough of it for this race. We've got one, two, three, four cars lined up into this battle. What a way to finish this one. Is there damage from the contact he had earlier? Is he limping to try and bring this one home? He's going to have one lap to try and defend on multiple cars that look mighty quick in comparison. Look out for Barry West. He's going to try to take it three. Why? Because he's got the top end speed. He's that third car line. Seamus Power trying to stick in the middle. It's still going to be Boscus coming out in front out of turn number one. Couldn't quite cut back underneath, and it's so narrow through this part of the track. No place for him to go. Once again, he is going to go around the outside initially as we check out Freckleton still battling. And it seems like we got one more corner to go for Juan Mi Costa, our leader. He's led from the start, and the number one is going to take victory here at Zandvoort. A nice race for Costa, and Freckleton does get around that number 12 car of Haas back there. Gernoff Risha, second place. Anti Lapisto rounds out your podium, but this battle a little bit further back between Power and West, and actually Seamus Power is going to try to sneak up the inside of Boscus right now. This is headed into Hans Ernst. This is where Cam got hit last time, but much better on the brakes. Power is going to be able to get by and was able to do what Cam was not. And Barry West is actually going to try to get around. Remember, he's got the top end speed, and if Boscus has a wounded car, this position is still up for grabs. Around the final turn here, Barry West is going to try to pop out, but I just don't think there's quite enough room. There is not. It was about a tenth of a second between them at the line. It was close, but no cigar for the big cat. As uh, Samaran, haven't checked in on him for some time, still down in 15th, is now on the back of Gallus, who spun earlier. Let's hope the Gallus doesn't lose yet another one here. And it looks like he is going to be able to hold on to it. That's going to be some of our last cars to finish as Lunig will be the final one. Only one DNF today. 
That is going to take us to a quick break. We'll come back with the unofficial results as well as driver interviews. So stick around.
Welcome back to Zandvoort. Round four of this Sunday Grand Prix series sees Juan Costa strike back and take the win over Anti Lepisto. But it wasn't Lepisto in second. It was Gernot Frisha who wound up P2. Anti just did not get off the line. He had to pass his way back onto the podium. Once he did, there was just too much distance, unfortunately. Uh, Tobias Runer came home in fourth with Dylan Freckleton somehow getting back into a P5 finish. He certainly was all over the place there at the end of this race. Oliver Haas was six, and then Timothy Reed finished seventh today. Seamus Power also had quite the wild ride going from 16th to eighth. Jean-Francois Boscus was ninth, and Barry West rounds out your top 10. In 11th, we have Stefan Walder back here in the number six car. Cam Porter finishes in 12th. A little bit of a shame for Cam because he did such a great pass there and then kind of fell down the track position order. Alan Berteau finishing in 13th with Christian Kremer in 14th. Daniel Gallus, 15th. Patrick Samaran, 16th. Sven Lunig in 17th. And then the only car that did not finish, like you were pointing out, Joe, is that number eight of Florian Hoon. That's going to take us to our winner for this race, Juan Mi Costa, who has come back and taken a win here today. Juan Mi, uh, it looked like you had it well under control on this one, uh, but you kind of needed it. Obviously, drop weeks will help you since you missed out at, at, uh, at Barcelona last time out. But what are your feelings now that you've uh, uh, taken a win back over Antti? Oh, it's great to take a win again because Antti is super fast. Yeah. He barely makes a mistake. He, he, when he makes one, or, or you take advantage of that, or you won't, you will miss it later in the season, I, I think. He's been super consistent, so you have to be there all, all the time you can. I'm very curious about, because we didn't really watch you much since you didn't have many battles. What kind of line were you taking through turn three, the the banked left-hander of Hugenholz? Because we saw some drivers try to stick to the middle line. A, a lot of them obviously went up high, but what did you find was best? For me, it's always the highest possible. You can even take the all the car out outside the line without taking an off track, but it's not as banked as the as the corner itself, so you want maybe one. You can try go one one wheel of the of the line, but you see if you could all the four four tires inside the inside the line on the high line is for me is the best. It, it seems like Anti is like you said he's very fast this season. He's he's keeping you honest. What do you feel about Philip Island? Do you think he'll be a bigger threat out in Australia? I don't know, it's not the, my best track. I, I always mess up in, the, in that track for some reason. So we'll see how how it, how it drives. Because I think last time we drive here, there, it was with with the with the past tires, not the new ones. So it will be interesting to see how it feels. Well, we'll, we'll let you get to practicing then, and best of luck next round. Thank you very much. Right. That was that was our winner, Juan Mi Costa, taking victory here in round four. Behind him, it was Gernot Frisha. Joey has caught up with him. Well, Gernot Frisha, first of all, congratulations on another podium. A good second place today. Thanks, Joey. That this uh, was a tough one because a couple of guys, have, I think the, the top seven guys, had so, you know, so such a good pace. It was really a tricky race. It seemed like it really came down to the track position and the launch into turn number one, because a after that, you guys were all kind of on your own pace. Did you feel like you maybe had something to go catch Costa out front, or, or was he just gone? I guess he still had a little bit in reserve, so I wasn't confident to really close the gap. Uh, I think he was managing the gap, basically. So yeah, I've been lucky at the start because Antti had a really bad start and uh, took profit. Uh, then yeah, just just tried to to go as, as quick as possible because in the end, Antti was doing super fast laps and uh, closing the gap to me, so it was, was tough. I, we were noticing that Lapista was definitely closing it in on you, but I think looking through this, you did claim fast lap with a 22.481. So 
Gernot, even though that you finished second and Costa ran away and Lapista was closing in, it still showed that you had the fastest pace out there. And so you, you got to walk away at least happy with that. Looking forward into next week, it looks like you guys are going to Phillip Island. You going to be showing up and racing with us again? Not sure yet because I'll, I'll be traveling most of the week, so I have almost zero time for, for practice. But on the other hand, it's a track that I really like and that I know well. So yeah, I'll, I'll really have to decide short term on Sunday. Well, I always enjoy watching your race out here. So thank you for coming out and participating with us. Anybody you want to give a shout out to you before I let you go? Thanks to you guys and huge congrats to Juan Mi once again and to Antti as well. Bye bye. That was Gernot Frisha coming home second today at Zanfort. And then we've got Dylan Freckleton who got himself a top five, but man, what excitement did he give us out there? Dylan, this is a track known for passing being quite difficult and yet you seem to manage pretty well today. Yeah, that was fun. Um, yeah, I, I was really pleased with the pace I had and then I messed up literally everything else. Um, Messed up qualifying, messed up the start, and then had a spin at the end that was mostly just sort of frustration going for the fastest lap, which I wouldn't have got anyway. Um, but it was a lot of fun sort of coming back through the field. So I enjoyed that. Yeah, you you definitely charged through in a way that, that surprised us and got us up out of our seat. There at the end, uh, unfortunately, uh, that, that little mistake, what were the tires feeling like uh, in this race we saw a few that looked like maybe the rears kind of started to go by the end um i don't think it was the tires um i think honestly i mean that uh, i think it's turn nine it's a really tricky one sort of whenever um i don't know why i've never got the hang of it um and i think it was just a case of pushing too hard the tires were fine i was getting sort of quicker and quicker as the race went on um so i think it was it was my mistake rather than necessarily the tires going off uh, well, uh, uh, commiserations on, on that one. Even still, uh, we're seeing you have quite the good season here. Uh, I don't see what the other results were, but a 60 and a 65 points uh, is a pretty healthy one. You missed last round. Uh, what are you anticipating fighting for in terms of total results? Um, I don't know, to be honest. Um, yeah, definitely this season I've made a, a good step in terms of the pace. Um, I kind of realized the last couple of seasons I've been overdriving the car. Um, and ironically, it's when I went and did a race in the uh, Radical at the end of last season. And within about five laps of driving that, I realized what I was doing wrong in the Lotus. Um, so yeah, just being a bit more careful on the entry and you find loads of speeds through the rest of the corner. Um, so it's nice to know that sort of that change is paying off and i'm getting quicker i just need to try and keep it on the track now <laughs> yeah that's that's job one always well congratulations on a top five and best of luck thank you very much dylan finished uh, p5 as i mentioned but also is fifth in the points after these four rounds or coming into this fourth round i should say meanwhile i think joey is going to be talking to the big cat seeing how he felt about all the fun he had today well barry west comes home with a top 10 finish but you had a race on your hands the entire time it seemed like seamus power was right on your gearbox literally the entire race long how was that for you yeah, I mean, that was fun. That was fun. Um, I, I went with a low downforce set, and I think um, it, it gained me time at the end of the straight, but that's the only place it was good for if I uh, for overtaking. But it was frustrating for drivers behind me in the slow bits. But, um, I mean, we banged wheels a few times. I think he um, <laughs> would take me on the grass and lap four. Um, it said I had wheel damage, so um, it, it didn't feel as good as what it was earlier. But... Uh, yeah, it was a uh, it was a fun race. There was three three of us three wide into Tarzan. I think one one lap was fun, but yeah. And then on the last lap, well, last but one lap, um, Jean Francois um, messed up the uh, the hairpin, and I got balked slightly. I thought, oh, it's my chance to get him, and uh, and Seamus got a good exit and got past. So fair play to him. But yeah, it's frustrating all the race. I kept him behind, and then to lose at the end was. Uh, yeah, could have been another couple of places easy, but it's the way it goes. Good fun. 
A couple things. So go back and watch the broadcast because we caught that moment down there, turn one, three wide between you guys. So that was always exciting to watch that. And then I have to ask you because we noticed it all of race long. Seamus was capitalizing on you on that turn three high lane. Why yeah. didn't you go up there and try it yourself? Was it from the wheel damage? Was it just from the lower downforce and the confidence? And did you see it there in your mirror? I think I, I wanted to know what his line was and I couldn't see his line because <laughs> I knew he was faster than me there. And I thought if he gets um, on the outside of me in the next little kink, um, it could be curtains. But uh, so I had to defend the inside into did Lion Dyke a few times. And I was fairly good around there. But um, yeah, I, 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 um, I wished I'd have practiced the higher line a bit more. Um, I thought the middle line was, was safe. And then when I, um, yeah, just, just, it was just safer. Um, I should have tried. I did try it on the last lap, I think. But uh, yeah, I should have done. I should have done. You're right. <laughs> well, Barry, you got to be happy with the top 10. Congratulations on today's performance. Yeah, well, thanks very much. I mean, the cat's got his claws retracted for this one, I think. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Digging into the character. So that was Barry West finishing 10th here today at Sanford, Joe. Yeah, but the, the cat still gave us a good show at the circus, I think. And uh, we're going to wrap this one up with a big thank you to the Lotus 79 community for bringing us back for another season of coverage, as well as to the team today, Joey, Daniel, and Dougie. Make sure to check out our social media, our website, and our merchandise store. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss a moment here on GSRC. As we mentioned, Phillip Island going to be the next one Sunday, April 14th at uh, 1030 a.m. Eastern since uh, we will have the majors next week. So going to be a little bit earlier. Be sure to check out our other broadcasts that we have listed here in the meantime. And until next time, race clean, race hard. We'll see you on the track.